Hello everyone, I'll just give it a couple of seconds for everyone to settle in and um, I hope you can all see us and hear us. So hello and welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust. For those of you who don't know, a short introduction, the ISM Trust is the Incorporated Society of Musicians sister charity and works to ensure that all music professionals in the UK can reach their full potential. We create pioneering resources to support all those who work in music and seek to challenge, educate and inspire through webinars, seminars, events, printed and digital resources and advice packs. I am Maria Vizitiu and I'm Membership and Events Manager at the ISM and it is my pleasure to be joined this evening by Paul Harris, award-winning author, music teacher and ISM member, who will talk about his new book, Unconditional Teaching. Today's guest speakers are Dr. Maria Luca, Head of Regents Centre for Re Relational Studies and Psychological Wellbeing, Simon Deersley, former Director of Music at Stowe School, and Sir Anthony Selden, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, educator and contemporary historian. A quick mention that you can get 20% off Paul Harris's new book, Unconditional Teaching, at FaberMusic.com if you enter ISM20 at the checkout to apply the discount. And that is valid until the 20th of December 2021. I also have a few technical points for you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound quality issues, please let us know in the chat box and we'll make attempts to resolve the issue. If you wish to use them, subtitles are available by enabling them at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's Trust website at ismtrust.org forward slash webinars, as well as on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please let us know in the Q&A box and we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as possible at the end. I will now hand over to Paul who will share a presentation and then we will hear a bit from our guest speakers. Hi, Paul, and welcome. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to switch to my screen if I may. Uh, I hope everyone can now see that. Um, thank you very much indeed everyone who's who's uh, joined us this evening. Thank you so much for coming uh, and uh, thank you for taking part. What I want to talk about just for, for a little while um, is some thoughts that, that I've been writing about in, the, in this new book which I think and I hope is, is really rather provocative and very much uh, important for the times in which we live at the moment, which I think clearly are rather difficult times. I know so much that we have accepted in one way or another or taken for granted is being challenged at the moment. Some of that is good, but some of that isn't quite so good. Uh, and it seems to me that the arts and the humanities are to some degree under some kind of threat. Um, but we all agree, I'm sure, that they are central to the future of a civilized society. And so it's become incredibly important that we strive to interest and maintain the interest of as many young people as we can in, in the arts and keep them interested. My particular interest, of course, as is almost everyone here, um, is, is the wonderful art of music. And I'm just a little worried about its future. And so the way we teach it has become, I think, really rather critical today. So this is what has initiated this desire to, to consider the benefits of teaching unconditionally. So what do I mean by that? Here's the sun. The sun is unconditional. It shines and provides light and warmth unconditionally for everyone. Uh, doctors and medics are unconditional in their desire to help all their patients. So might it help if teachers are unconditional too? Can we be unconditional? What does it mean to be unconditional? These are some of the questions I want to, to talk about. Once we begin to think about these things, we realize that virtually everything in life actually is conditional. Um, but maybe trying to be more unconditional and doing certain things in a more unconditional way might considerably improve the success of doing those things. And that's what this short talk and what my new book really is about. Um, let, let's plunge into this word condition first. It's actually a really rather a complex word because it has so many meanings. You know, the condition that we might find something. Um, our working conditions are very good. I hope yours are today. Uh, under these conditions, I'm happy to do this or not. He suffers from a condition, but his condition has improved. 
um, I'm exercising to get back into condition. For terms and conditions tick here. Uh, there are so many words, there are, there are more, um, air conditioning and hair conditioner, all sorts of things. Um, so for this particular short talk on my book, um, to, to make sense, um, I have to tell you what I mean by the word condition. And I simply mean, these are my conditions, these are my requirements. I'll do this on condition that means I'll do that if, I'll do that if. That's really what I mean the word to, you, to, to, to mean. Interestingly, and maybe a little ironically, I'm going to begin by suggesting that to aspire to teach unconditionally, we probably need to satisfy certain conditions. Um, and, and I'm going to suggest that we probably need to satisfy some particular beliefs in our minds, in a sense, requirements or conditions. Uh, for example, it's helpful if we believe that teaching is an important and unique occupation. I think teaching is maybe the, the, the most important job in the world. It's helpful if we believe that the art and craft of teaching is something worthy of continual further study. Uh, of course, many people do have an instinct that, uh, that leads them naturally to good teaching, but I think through their integrity and their desire to do the very best, good teachers are continually and constantly driven by a desire to, to do better and to think more about their, their teaching. It's helpful if we believe in what we are teaching, uh, in, the, in this case music and more specifically musical performance, and to believe that it can truly contribute to a greater good. Uh, and it's helpful if we believe that all those who we are teaching are worthy of our teaching. And I think if we do satisfy those beliefs, in a sense, these kind of background conditions, the way is open for the most exciting teaching and learning. And we will be able to embark on a journey that hopefully will take us to a place where our teaching can always flow without interruption, where the, where, where the process is positive and engaging and, and where all our pupils uh, have a, a greatest desire and ability to succeed. Uh, I have to say right up front, actually, that I don't think we can ever be entirely unconditional, nor should we be. But aspiring to being more unconditional as teachers, and indeed as people, is a worthy aspiration. So I'd like to take you on a little journey uh, this afternoon into a world, into the world maybe of conditional and unconditional behaviours, and show you some ways of beginning to make the transition, if you feel you'd like to. Uh, you may already be there or, or part of the way there, but, but whichever, I, I hope you'll find the journey interesting. Uh, so let's by, begin by looking at certain different kinds of conditions. Uh, and, and, and it's important because we'll see how necessary conditions are in life. You know, conditions are, in a sense, requirements. And sometimes these requirements are essential. Um, they, for example, take the form of barriers or boundaries or laws for the purposes of protection. Um, here's one example I talk about many more in the book. You know, you can come into our zoo on condition that you don't try to jump into the enclosure with the animals. And of course, there are many more. Conditions are requirements in the in sense of prerequisites. For example, you can come to our school or our college if you pass this exam. And uh, once you're here, you have to then abide by our conditions, whatever they may be, uh, or we may throw you out. And of course, teachers have, in a sense, to abide by those rules as well. Conditions may be seen as currency. Um, for example, uh, whoops, um, you know, I'll teach you on the condition that you pay me for those lessons. Sometimes conditions are un unstated, um, but kind of understood. And they're virtually concerned with everything. And sometimes we have multiple conditions concerned with one thing, for example, you can come on my course to improve crossing the break, the thing we clarinetists do, on condition that you play the clarinet, you have a clarinet, you can cross the break already, and you want to improve doing so, multiple conditions. In, in a way, conditions are indeed negative, uh, and indeed uh, important, they're necessary, but they can become negative, and if they become negative, that's when they begin to cause frustration or unhappiness or discontent. And that's where the trouble can begin. Now, my condition is that you practice for five minutes 
or 20 minutes or an hour or four hours every day. Or maybe my condition is that you progress at a certain pace. And under these kind of conditions, things can start going wrong. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit uh, as we move forward. Being completely unconditional means doing without expecting anything in return. So we really can't be that. But we do need to be aware if there are any conditions that might be blocking the way, which we might need to learn to control or manage or even eliminate, which I think we can do. So let's look first at what both kinds of teaching might be. Conditional teaching. I'll do this if. Uh, and I, I want you to kind of consider, not, not now at this moment, but do you have any conditions? Um, I, I think it's a rather a difficult question, really. Uh, and maybe you might not have ever thought about it. But I think we probably do. Um, I, I think we probably do have uh, conditions. And it's worth thinking about. Uh, and then by having thought about them, we can begin to think about how we might get rid of them if they are actually getting in the way. Um, sometimes they may be really quite deep rooted in our in our subconsciousness, uh, sub subconsciousness. Um, but if they have a bearing in our teaching, particularly in a negative kind of way, we do need to think about it. I want to go through what some of these may be. Uh, and, and as I kind of say them in the back of your mind, maybe you might be thinking, I prefer it and will be more comfortable in my teaching on the condition that, for example, I have a nice room. You know, if I'm not teaching in a nice room, I don't really feel very comfortable and maybe I won't teach at my best. Uh, my pupil is respectful. Um, my pupil has practiced because if they haven't, you know, what's the point of me giving them a lesson? My pupil has brought their books because if they haven't, it kind of shows a certain, maybe a certain disrespect. Um, my pupil makes mistakes because if they didn't make mistakes, you know, what's the point of teaching? Uh, I, I've heard that thought given by certain teachers. My people tries hard because, you know, if they don't try hard, why, why should I try hard? Uh, my pupil rises to my expectations. My pupil is achieving because if there's not, not achieving, you know, why do I need to put in this effort? And there are others um, which I discuss in the book, but th those are some which I just like to, to mention. Uh, and so if my pupils satisfy all my conditions, or most of them, then they're good pupils and, you know, we're happy to teach them. But if they don't, it can affect us in many ways. And, and again, in the book, <coughs> excuse me, in the book, I do discuss these at some length, but let me just give you a, a couple of examples. It, it may affect our behaviour in ways that, you know, we may not be aware of. You know, pay, maybe we pay more attention to the responses of pupils who satisfy our conditions and we spend more time talking to them. Maybe we tend to give more positive feedback to our better pupils and more criticism to pupils who may continually test our conditions. You know, and I go into many more potential kinds of behaviours that we might exhibit in the book. But the result, of course, of that is that fewer pupils achieve. So that's why I hope we would all agree that possibly moving towards teaching without conditions, I hope we think is, is perhaps preferable. Um, and if pupils don't achieve, they, they probably give up and we really don't want that to happen. And also conditions block flow. Too many conditions simply block the flow. They block the flow of that wonderful energy that is created when teaching and learning are really happening in a lesson. Why might we have such conditions? Um, and I, I think they, they, they fundamentally stem from two things. Firstly, they stem from what we value, what we value about ourselves and about values that we place on other things. And then there's a rather darker reason for these conditions. Um, a potential need to feed the ego and a sense of self-importance, you know, um, I only teach the best pupils, all my pupils get distinctions, all my pupils practice six hours a day, and I take my pupils' achievements as my own. They, they did well because of me. Uh, and as developing musicians and teachers, it's these deeper fundamental values that drive our thinking and, and our teaching. Uh, and we do need to keep these in mind 
because they also drive what we value and more importantly maybe and maybe a little darkly who we value uh, and there are also what what would i call hidden conditions um and i'm not going to go into many of these today but for example here's a thought some people are more musical than others well is that true is that not true um some people's musical nature might start flowering quite quickly for others it may take a lot more time um, and some may seem more musical than others but you know is it something that is going to affect our thinking uh, some pupils may shape a phrase more beautifully than others um, well how might time affect that um, some may sing or play more in time or in tune uh, you know i've got two beginners and one day for some reason somewhere in my mind i think because i love beethoven sonatas one of these people's one day is going to play a beethoven sonata but i don't think the other one is is that going to affect the way that we might teach those pupils this pupil seems to be interested in in developing their technique this pupil seems to be at a sight read or is interested in music theory um or does well at exams and assessments do these conditions because they are conditions in a sense you know what effect are they going to have on the way we teach the way we think about our pupils indeed can we have good and worthwhile pupils without being or doing these things how how do we invest our time and energy if they don't seem to meet these conditions can we have these worthwhile pupils and of course my answer to this is a resounding a resounding yes there are no bad pupils. There are no pupils for whom it is a waste of time to teach. You know, it might not seem like that sometimes. There may be difficult pupils, but ultimately it's a great and wonderful truth to accept, really. Just before I kind of turn the tables, um, I just want to answer this question. I know we know the answer. What is a lesson for? But also it's an opportunity to develop our pupils' self-confidence and self-esteem and self-belief. And self-belief, you know, what, what does our worth and the worth of our pupils hang on? It's so important because self-worth gives us the confidence and energy and motivation to try, to have a go, to take part, to contribute positively, gives us security, helps us to learn. Um, it gives us self-worth. What is our worth um, dependent on? Our worth, I hope, is dependent on our pupils achieving and progressing and, and enjoying themselves, smiling and, uh, and, and in our ability to develop their self-esteem and self-belief, those things. Our worth, I hope, is not dependent on our pupils getting high marks at exams or playing advanced pieces or always playing in tune. It's nice when these things happen, but as teachers, they don't define our worth or shouldn't, because they cause conditional teaching. Fewer win. It's exclusive. You know, I only teach the good pupils, and I get annoyed because I have so many bad pupils. It, it, it actually creates a, a bad place. It, it can send us into a bad place where we begin to feel I don't deserve this, and all these kind of things start happening. What about our pupils' worth? Um, I, I want to feel that, that it's all about achievement rather than attainment. Um, a thing done successfully with courage and an and enjoyment rather than, you know, passing an exam, for example, which is good, but not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, and with growing self-worth, pupils are more confident and more motivated to pursue their goals. So we want to move towards con unconditional teaching and three things quick things i just want to mention in this journey mindsets some practical strategies and looking inwards and of course i go into much more detail in the book but let's just have a a quick look first of all mindsets and i want to take one or two of those points the nice room for example you know maybe we're not given a, a good space to teach i deserve better we might think but you know it doesn't matter um, I've taught in a corridor, I've taught in a cupboard. Um, when I was at school, I was, I was taught in a cupboard, but my teacher didn't seem to mind that too much. Um, maybe we can take responsibility and tidy the room up at the beginning of a day, but let's remove it 
from becoming a condition. Now, what about pupils practicing? You know, I'm happily, I'm happy to teach you, but the deal is you have to practice. Otherwise, lessons don't work. It's very conditional. Um, you know, what happens if no practice? Well, what do we do? Do we send the pupil away? Do we get annoyed? Do we get frustrated? Or do we take responsibility? And that is what the more unconditional teacher is moving towards. Maybe we aim to make all our responses as positive as possible, whatever our pupil is doing. Sometimes we begin with, when you practice this. Occasionally we might ask, what should we do next? to begin to implant this idea in our pupils that they, they can practice because they want to practice. And what about pupils making mistakes? You know, if my pupils didn't make mistakes, there'd be no point in lessons, is a thought I've heard. I won't teach you unless you make mistakes. Well, whose responsibility is it if our pupil makes a mistake? If we set up each activity carefully, if we make sure pupils know what they're expected to do, then the chances of mistakes are hugely reduced. Pupils make slips, may, many, maybe many slips, but slips aren't mistakes. There's no emotional value attached. Whose fault is it is always what we need to, to remember. Uh, I talk in the book a lot about group teaching. Um, I'm not going to talk very much today. Here's a couple of the many questions. And, and I sent lots of questionnaires to teachers about their teaching to come up with the kind of conditions of group teaching. Um, and here's two interesting ones. Um, you know, I can do my best group teaching on condition that the pupils are as evenly matched as possible, or that the pupils are not continually comparing themselves with each other. Well, let's take one of these, these the pupils not continually comparing themselves with each other. They will actually, because that's how young people are. But if they're doing their best, then that's good enough. Um, Self-comparison is good. All our pupils will have strengths, different ones. Um, and if we can allow them to understand that, then they begin to get on with each other and stop negatively comparing themselves. A bit of friendly competition is fine anyway. Do learners themselves have conditions? That's an area uh, I go into a lot in the book. Um, and there's a lot of things that they give us to think about. I, I ask a lot of learners to answer these questions, got some very interesting responses. You know, I'll work harder on condition that, and I give many thoughts in the book, but here's a few. You know, my teachers are passionate about their subject. That, of course, is a very nice thought. My teacher explains why I'm to do something. I can see progress being made, which if we teach in the simultaneous learning way, of course, is happening all the time. My teachers are kind and make me feel welcome. And my, one of my favorites, my teachers don't tell me about their problems. Um, so our pupils do have conditions. One or two practical strategies. And again, um, I talk about many of them in the book. Um, just the one I'd like to mention today is the importance of avoiding formulaic teaching. This is how I teach. My good pupils get it and my bad pupils don't. You know, this sentiment hides a condition. I'm happy to teach you on condition that you're capable of learning from my methods and respond the way I would expect and like best. That's not acceptable, really. Um, and of course, if you know about my simultaneous learning idea, it's not going to happen. Um, it's all about getting from A to B. You know, here's where you are now. Here's something to do to get you to B. And some pupils may get from A to B in one go. Uh, but if they don't, um, the good teacher knows lots of other little areas, lots of other little A's to B's that we go in order to get from the, the top A to B, because all these other little A's to B's are still A's to B's. Uh, and as we set up each little activity and our pupil gets it, they're gradually moving in a positive direction. Doesn't necessarily be the one we thought of at the very beginning. What about our responsibility, the way we respond to our pupils, feedback? And again, I, I, I talk about this a lot in, in my Virtuoso Teach book, but I just want to talk about the conditional angle today. You know, we devise an activity, pupil carries out the activity, we, res we, uh, we observe and then we respond. I just want to mention the conditionality of that response. Uh, and I want to ask this question, to what extent is the positivity of our response conditional 
on how well our pupil carried out that activity. And the, the answer I want to give is this, we should always respond to what our pupils did positively, irrespective of how they did it. And if they didn't do it so well, maybe we take responsibility uh, and try to suggest it in another way. More practical strategies uh, in the book, I talk about many more. Um, and finally, let's look just for a moment inwards. Uh, and there are three points I want to make in, in general terms, developing our self-awareness, developing empathy and controlling the ego. Uh, I want us to develop all these things. Um, and it's very important that we think about this. Just a few thoughts, developing our self-awareness. Uh, we do need to look inwards, maybe deeply sometimes into our personalities to determine whether we are thinking in ways that can reduce and, and perhaps even eliminate some of these conditions. You know, high levels of self-awareness lead to high levels of self-control. We begin to manage what we say and do more carefully, which is not to say that we can't you know, be inst instinctive and spontaneous. Of course we can. Uh, and if we are well balanced and self-aware in our approach, you know, we can shift smoothly from instinctive and spontaneous responses to more intentionally considered ones you know, in order to, to move forward. Um, but, but this kind of behavior derives from a deeper understanding about the consequences of our actions. And so we become more self-aware. Uh, which is very interesting. We become aware of our values and our beliefs and how these might affect our behavior and our expectations. We become more aware of how we're perceived by others. Uh, and it's fascinating and it's very interesting to begin to go into these areas. And I deal with this quite a lot more in the book. Uh, developing our empathy uh, is very important. Our ability to communicate successfully, taking into account how our pupils are thinking and feeling about you know, what they are doing and what we are teaching them and how the lesson is going. Um, and you know, just noticing things like changes in energy levels, tone of voice, facial expression, these can all be indicators of how our pupils are getting on. And the quicker we can pick up these signals, uh, the quicker we can put things right and, and get back into the flow if, if, if we do lose the flow occasionally. And, and through empathy, we can become more aware and more able to control our conditions, if we have any. Uh, and it all becomes very interesting, I think. And finally, controlling the ego. Uh, and all I'm going to say really about this is, is, is putting it in a rather, rather simplistic terms, really. But, you know, on the one end, we have those with big egos. I only teach the tiny minority who satisfy all my many conditions. Uh, and of course, that, that is not a good place to be really. Um, and so many of our pupils will just drop off the edge. On the very end of the spectrum, I'll teach anyone who wants to learn, anyone who wants to learn, irrespective of conditions. And that's a very nice place to be. Uh, and so here's another spectrum really, um, conditional teaching, on one end and unconditional teaching at the other. It's not an outcome. It's not a destination that at some point we finally reach. It's simply a state to which, towards which I think we should always be striving. Uh, and it's a wonderful place to be, unconditional teaching. It's a state where, where the flow and the magic of effective teaching and learning really begin to happen. So just to, to go back to, to where I started really, um, the sun is unconditional. It, it was a poetic statement. Human beings are continually making choices and so are much more complex in their conditionality. But I think with increased awareness, we can all aspire to be more unconditional in our teaching. And this can have a incredibly powerful and transformative effect on the success of our teaching and on the future of our pupils and maybe even on the future uh, in, in a much broader sense. So it does seem to me to be something well worth aspiring to. And so 
here it is. Um, all that and, and a lot more. So I hope I made some sense in, in that little introduction to, to what I think the aspiration towards teaching unconditionally is all about. There we are. Let me unshare and go back to Maria. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. That was, uh, I can all, all, I think we can all agree, incredibly um, inspiring. Um, it's time now to hear for a little bit from our guest speakers for this evening. So firstly, Sir Anthony Selden, who's former Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, as well as educator and contemporary historian. He also wrote the foreword to the book. Um, then we'll hear from Dr. Maria Luca, who's head of the Regents Centre of Relational Studies and Psychological Wellbeing, course leader of the PhD programme in psychotherapy and psychology. She was also a great help to Paul in writing the book in terms of reviewing ideas from a psychological standpoint and her testimonial features in the book. And finally, uh, Simon Deersley, former director of music at Stowe School, where Paul also thought, uh, taught, sorry, and currently head of keyboard studies at Queen Margaret's School. So welcome everyone. Um, hello, let me just, Sir Simon and Anthony, you might need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. And uh, very nice to be here. Shall I start, Maria? Yes, yes, please. Uh, well, many thanks to Maria for, uh, for the organisation of today and to Paul uh, for that very clear and uh, uplifting talk. I'm just going to add three thoughts today based upon my own experience as a, um, a vice chancellor, but as a head uh, teacher for, for 20 years uh, and uh, who tried to do a great deal to encourage music uh, in the schools that I ran, um, but also somebody who writes and reflects on, on well-being and happiness. I, the, so the three points to complement, I hope, what uh, Paul has given us tonight, uh, without uh, repeating too much, is, is first of all, um, the, the importance of being open-hearted, implied there in what Paul was saying, but also open-minded. Um, and that's a journey in life towards uh, being open-hearted. And uh, it doesn't necessarily happen at all. Uh, but the, my experience as a teacher, um, as an academic, as, as a head, uh, as a vice chancellor, was that the more open hearted my colleagues were, the better they were with the students. Um, the more open-minded they were, the less obsessed by their own fixed uh, vision about what was right and what was wrong, uh, the more they could truly engage. If you come into a student with a very fixed mindset, um, if you are unprepared to learn yourself, uh, then it's going to be a much more limited engagement. The best teaching uh, always sees the teacher learn as much as the students. That's point one. Point two is the journey of travel in life. Uh, when I was learning to be a teacher doing a postgraduate year at King's College London, I wrote a thesis about how can teachers become more self-aware, more self-critical, given that so much of what they do is essentially locked away from other uh, adults for all observation and uh, mentoring uh, and inspection. Um, and how can we ensure that every day we get better? To me, and I'd often say this, um, even though it wasn't always popular to say it, the heroes were those people who on their last day at work uh, whether they were leaving the profession mid-career or maybe uh, heading for retirement, uh, whether they were as eager to teach and to learn as they were on the first day. Uh, and uh, those teachers who become weary, 
uh, full of their own uh, fascinating opinions um, on absolutely everything. Um, that that's a choice that you make. That the more um, it isn't necessary. It doesn't necessarily have to happen. That uh, teach the older they get, uh, the more cynical, the more snarly, the more opinionated, the more judgmental they become. It doesn't have to happen. And if that does happen, um, without doubt, uh, if that's happening to you listening to this, uh, because it will make you less happy uh, and uh, it will also mean that you're less good as a teacher with your students. So the direction of travel in uh, is one of uh, being, as Paul suggesting, being unconditional, uh, moving toward ever greater lightness. Uh, are you rising up or are you being dragged down by the cumbersome weight of your own dead uh, views or are you being enchanted and uplifted by the music, by the uh, whatever you're teaching and by the sheer utter devastating joy of engaging with young people. That was point number two, point number three very quickly is um, I spent a lot of my life involved in well-being. I founded a charity 10 years ago, co-founded it called Action for Happiness, Action for Happiness. It talks about 10 steps that we can all take in our own lives to make our own lives more happy um, and to take greater care of ourselves. It is doing you no good, it's doing your family no good, it's doing your institution, it's doing your students no good if you become unwell or exhausted or dog tired uh, over the course of a week, a term, a year, a lifetime. So looking after your own well-being, there are 10 steps that we talk about there, all of which will help make you much more unconditional as a human being, much happier, much more engaged, much more light, much more enchanted, much freer, uh, much more open, much more receptive, much more sociable, uh, much more engaged. Uh, but we need to make these conscious and deliberate and intentional efforts. So we talk about the 10 steps there. Um, they are not ours, they're drawn from best wisdom. Uh, and indeed, let me finish by saying that Paul exemplifies uh, all those three factors that I've talked about there, about uh, being open-hearted and open-minded. Secondly, making a journey towards ever greater lightness and ever greater heaviness. heaviness. And thirdly, uh, taking care of your own well-being is not selfish, it's the opposite of selfish. Uh, and if you want a, an exemplar, look at Paul. That's it, Maria, over and out from, from me. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria Luca. Sorry, you're just unmuted. Uh, sorry, so you're just on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Apologies. It's all right. All good. Okay. Uh, you may wonder what a psychotherapist like myself might have to say about unconditional music teaching. Well, uh, the word unconditional has powerful associations and connotations for me as a psychotherapist, as an educator in higher education of mature students of psychology and psychotherapy. And unconditional was first the word used by Carl Rogers, an American psychologist back in the 60s. And what Rogers was uh, referring to was a new type of psychological thinking which came to be known as humanistic psychology. Now, why am I saying this? Because having read the book uh, that Paul has written, it is peppered with humanism. It is peppered with principles of openness, fluidity as opposed to rigidity, it's peppered with a sense of mutual respect, engagement, not just expectation on the part of our students or pupils, but also on the part of the teachers. 
And as a lecturer um, in academia, I've discovered that respecting my student means not having rigid expectations of them. And this is what Paul's book is actually providing for the reader, that sense of aspiring towards something. And as Paul mentioned earlier, it is not about the outcome so much. It is about the process and that sense of wanting to meet our students at a deeper, more respectful level. Um, what Rogers, coming back to uh, humanistic psychology, was actually um, theorizing about was that conditional parenting actually negatively impacted on children's sense of uh, self-respect, sense of self-worth, sense of feeling good about themselves. So he set out to create an approach to helping people overcome that conditional parenting into developing a sense of self-worth through unconditional psychological input. So I found um, a Paul's um, approach of integrating humanistic psychology into uh, the teaching of music um, so very interesting. I just want to highlight what I have found um, uh, in this book um, before I finish and pass on to Simon. I found that uh, Paul uh, shares his soul and his personality in his book. It is um, the opposite of being rigid. It is very much about respect and fluidity. And these are existential principles also, which are part and parcel of humanism. It is wonderfully comprehensive. It is a comprehensive testament to unconditional teaching. I found it informs, it invites, it stimulates, and engages the reader. It proposes basically a humanitarian, interactive, and engaging style in teaching that moves beyond what Paul described earlier, personal expectations, and like Roger's client-centered therapy, the book moves towards a pupil-centered approach to teaching. Unlike many other books that I have read for testimonials, this is a book with a heart. Paul's creativity stood out for me through his attempts to integrate, integrate psychological ideas into a teaching approach arguably more effective than traditional teaching methods. And I have experienced this type of teaching to be much more effective and keeping our students awake as opposed to falling asleep in the classroom. And I'd like to congratulate Paul for achieving this phenomenal uh, achievement basically in unconditional teaching. Not only that, it is beautifully written, it is spiced up with psychological ideas, and it is richly illustrated. And I'd like to finish by saying a hearty congratulations to Paul for writing a gem of a book carried through with rigor and love. Thank you, Paul. I have enjoyed reading your book and I'm sure I will refer to it again and again in my own attempts towards unconditional teaching. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Simon. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for involving me in this um, uh, 
illuminating and rich, rich conversation uh, provided by you as the basis of your book. Um, I would just like to um, have everybody just know what sort of man Paul is. And it's actually his whole book is encapsulated in his dedication. Dedicated to all teachers who delight in teaching with kindness. And really, that is it. Um, I have been the director of music at three um, large schools, and the people who have always taught well are the ones who just have kindness about them. Um, and what I think is important is that all teachers have kindness about them. Um, they start with kindness. They, um, you know, no one sort of walks in and becomes a teacher because they want to damage children. They want to really help them. They want to develop them. They want them to be glorious. And Paul's book, Unconditional Teaching, it's just a fantastic reminder of why you're there. Why am I a teacher? Why am I involved in teaching? And Paul's book just absolutely just brings back, and if you didn't know it already, tells you, oh yes, this is the aspiration. And aspiration is a word that's bandied around. But remember, aspiration means a higher purpose. You're doing something for someone that is beyond yourself. And I love that. And that word aspiration is scattered throughout Paul's book. I think it's incredibly important that teachers really do, and I just don't mean music teachers. I think every teacher ought to have a copy of this book, whether it's chemistry, maths, and actually maybe even the physics teacher needs some more than the music teacher, I don't know. Um, my experience is very limited in that area. But I think it reminds everybody about what the principles of teaching are. It has to be done with kindness. Without your expectation that you're going to get kindness back, of course. But you're always, always looking to see where is this pupil going to go? How are they going to move there? How are they going to be inspired? And Paul gives example after example after example of methods, strategies, thoughts that will help you understand how you can best start to develop yourself. Many, many schools now know that a, a, a sort of very pragmatic way of developing your teaching staff is through inset. They're stimulated by further training. The years, I mean, my own teachers, I don't think ever went on a course to help their teaching in their lives. They were trained, they did it, and they worked out a sort of mold in which they did stuff. My geography teacher wrote everything down on seven gigantic blackboards and we wrote it all down. He never spoke to us directly. That was his method. That's what he'd been taught. Fortunately, I hope that doesn't happen anywhere now. We have an interactive relationship with these very, very extraordinary people who are our students. Paul's book reminds us of the respect we have to have for those people and how to develop that respect through unconditional approaches by always thinking, right, have I become locked in some way? Is the student unhappy because of this? Are they not practicing because of me? Having run departments and now teaching nothing but piano students every week, I never ask, have you practiced when they walk in the door? And that's due to Paul. And it always produces something which I never believed was possible as a young teacher, They've always practiced. They've always done something. Um, and even occasionally they might say, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Deersley, I haven't done anything this week. I say, it doesn't make any difference to me. There are so many things because this student has walked into my room 
which I always view as being a total A plus result. They're there. They've said my enthusiasm and passion for what you're going to do has meant I've remembered to not be in my favorite dance lesson, but I've come to you. And I then have the responsibility to build on that passion and enthusiasm because they have walked through the door. And at that moment, my job, um, again, inspired through our meeting at Stowe when I was appointed director of music there, and meeting Paul, leading to lots and lots of conversations of what that means when the pupil walks into the room for the lesson. And I have been endlessly inspired and excited. And when Paul was very kind, sending these different chapters and things for me to read um, in the middle of rural France where I was living, it was just utterly, utterly thrilling and exciting. My biggest message is to say, wonderful Paul, thank you again, because this work comes out of his simultaneous learning, his virtuoso teacher book, and also unconditional teaching. And each one brings us to a, highest, a higher level of expectation on us. My message to all teachers is feel that you deserve to actually improve, to develop, and to have the openness to enjoy every aspect of every student that you work with. And I would say, whether you're a music teacher or any other sort of teacher, you have that importance to inspire and to aspire for yourselves. If you do it for yourself, I promise you, all of your students will follow your lead. And that is the kernel of Paul's book. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. That's been great. Um, I think we might have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Um, so firstly, someone is saying, um, last month I refused to teach a student because he wanted to play pieces which I didn't know how to teach from a rap band. And actually I didn't want to listen and learn about their music. Is that unconditional teaching? Gosh, that, that, that's, that's a very difficult one. Um, the, 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 the fact, right. Yeah, Simon, do you, do you, have you got a point there? No, no, no. I mean, you just have to work. If they, they are that excited about bringing a piece to you, what can you do? You can't say, no, I, I, I don't teach that. I would say, this is not my style of music. I'm not sure I'm the best person for you. But let's look at it. Let's listen to it. Let's see what we can do. It's not my favourite type of music but let me do something to respond to your enthusiasm and passion. That, that's, I, I kind of made that, that, that particular case in the book somewhere. I remember writing about something like that. And that, that's, I think, is the way forward. We, we have to be upfront and say, this is not my music, if it's not my music. Um, and I, my, my, I, I am restricted in what I can do to help you. But let's look at it. There, there will inevitably be overlaps uh, there are principles behind music teaching, whatever the style of music it is, whatever the genre of music is that we're teaching, there are principles behind it. Uh, and, and we can but do our best. Uh, if we don't like that style, I, I expect we, we can say that. Uh, it's not my thing, but I'll do my best. Maybe you might have to go someone different to get the best out of learning this music, but let's see what the principles behind it are and we can explore that together. Perfect, thank you. Um, and next question is, um, might we continually need to reconnect with parents to assess and share expectations as you go, as their conditions may well have a bearing on our teaching as well? I think that's very important indeed. Uh, and, and parents often set it up for their, for their children. Um, and, and sometimes if we have the opportunity to explain to parents, you know, this is who I am, this is how I teach, this is why I think we should be doing this, uh, it might help. Uh, and, and some parents have very high expectations, not necessarily the appropriate high expectations, uh, and we need to discuss it. And, and I think there, there is you know, nothing to be lost by having that discussion. Uh, 
Uh, and if we can talk to parents, if we are in a situation where we can do that and say, no, this is who I am. I, you know, I believe that I'm a, a very good teacher. I understand what I'm doing. This is how I think we should move forward. I think this is what is best for your child. Can we agree upon this? Um, and, I, and I think if, if a parent sees someone speaking from the heart uh, and, and expressing what they believe in, uh, on the whole, they, they will be convinced, they will be persuaded. Lovely, thank you. And the last minute for the last question, Paul, I wonder if you can give us your thoughts on unconditional learning as well, please. Uh, well, well, I've talked about unconditional learning um, because it, interestingly, um, I, I, I wrote via one or two schools uh, to a lot of young people and I said, you know, what do you understand by unconditional learning? And it's not something maybe that, uh, that we can talk about, maybe another time we can actually have a whole session on that. Um, and, and, but unconditional learning, I, I think, really comes from unconditional teaching um, because we are teaching our pupils to learn unconditionally. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting area and I do want my pupils to be good learners. Uh, and I think if we approach them in a particular kind of way, uh, a lot about a lot of this is discussed in my Virtuoso Teacher book, actually, because I think almost the last line of that says, if we become Virtuoso teachers, which we can all become, what we create are virtuoso learners. Uh, in other words, people who learn well. And, and I think learning well in that respect is being unconditional. It's a very interesting and it's a big question and, and one that I think we'll have to meet again to go into that one in detail. Of course, perfect. Um, thank you very much. I think this is kind of all we have time for. So again, again, thank you very much, Paul, for an inspiring um, presentation and conversation and, and evening. Thank you for our guest speakers for being with us tonight. Um, and thank you for all you tuning in this afternoon. Um, the webinars I mentioned before will be available on the ISM's Trust website. That's ismtrust.org forward slash webinars. I believe the link will be in the chat box. Um, our website as well has a range of webinars available to view on demand. Majority of them are free. So please have a look um, on the next link that will pop in, in the chat now. Um, we have an, the next free webinar will be in January and look at PRS and we'll have a link coming up soon on our website if you want to have a look at that. And also our next free online event in music education is our Teach Meet, which will be in March. Um, and I believe there was a there was a link there previously, but my, my colleague will put it put that there. So lastly, again, thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you at another ISM Trust uh, event soon. So have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.